Thank you very much. Well, uh, I hope to excuse my New Zealand accent. I I'm learning Australian. Uh, it's a slow process. Um, and um, I I'm, I'm also getting enculturated uh, with uh, you know, Australian culture and so on. Um, I was really interested to hear um, Andrew Hastie on the, on the news this morning um, talking about China. Um, oh, excuse me, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I really want to say thank you to the editors of uh, Thesis 11 because the journal is one that I think is, uh, you know, a brilliant journal. I, I, I read it uh, both as a professional and a student. You know, it's one of that small coterie of journals, you know, New Left Review, Telos, uh, Thesis 11, you know, and, uh, you know, I was so, uh, so honoured to be invited to talk um, you know, when I received that inv invitation um, from um, from Thesis 11, from the editors of Thesis 11. So, you know, uh, Peter Bielhart, uh I know Peter Murphy going back some time, time has been a real, real pleasure to, re to meet um, Trevor, uh, Trevor Hogan, and uh, I, must, I must say you guys are doing a really great job, um, and it's really nice to see uh, that such a journal is still possible and sustainable in uh, kind of a neoliberal world, you know, and you, you, you really do uh, <coughs> provide um, a basis for some sort of hope for the next generation of people coming through. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you also to people who turned out tonight, which is uh, terrific to see uh, uh, such a, a large turnout. I, I, I hope but at the same time, you feel free enough to heckle me uh, during the presentation. Um, I'm kind of happy for you to do that. Uh, except for this man here, Fazil Risby, um, he's used to heckling me quite a lot, and we spent some time at, at uh, University of Illinois uh, teaching classes together, and um, he, uh, he had um, a very good effect on me. Um, I, I became very careful about what I said when we did our Laurel and Hardy act for our master's students. Um, I won't tell you who played the straight man. <laughs> um, but tonight, um, uh, I really, um, I I'm talking about uh, technopolitics, and let me see if I can get this, you know, the um, interesting element about technology is that when you're talking about it quite often, you know, uh, you have to rely on somebody who has better skills than you. And, my wife, Tina Beasley, is uh, the techie uh, in, in my family, and I want anything done, she can do it for me. I, I, I suspect uh, I have a license to use this, and, and I hope, hope it works. So let me see how I'm going here. I guess it's this one here. So <clears throat> I am going to say a little bit about philosophy, and, and I'm going to smuggle in some autobiographical comments by talking about Wittgenstein. Uh, and, and Leotard, and particularly Wittgenstein. And then I, I, I really want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about technoscience, um, the concept, the evolution of the concept, and, um, and an emotion called technopolitics now, which is well established in the literature. Um, and from there I go to uh, a concept, bioinformationalism, which is um, a concept which brings together new synthetic biology on the one hand, and informationalism, what Castell calls informationalism or new digitalism or technology and so on, their combination, particularly at the nano level. So this, this is very, I think, uh, the basis uh, for a new um, scientific, let me say technological, led uh, scientific revolution, at least as far as the National Science Foundation is concerned in terms of their ongoing agenda. Uh, um, and then, of course, uh, here comes the, the other parts of the, um, um, the concepts, a part of that uh, the title that I gave, Deep Con Convergence. So we're going to be talking about converging technologies uh, and technoscience cognotechnosciences and the value of cognitive efficiency and finally platform ontology. So by tomorrow morning um, I, I think I should be able to finish this, um, this talk. Let me move on. I, I guess somebody's uh, taking the time. So you, 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 you 
have a, an idea of how long I'm going to be talking. Three hours, you said, didn't you? Yeah, yeah something like that. Okay, so <coughs> let's move on pretty quickly. Here's the first section here on, on Jean-François Lietard and, 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 and Wittgenstein. How uh, these two go together for me is uh, you know, kind of interesting conception and I think probably unusual because we're talking about here a reception by a French philosopher of an Austrian thinker who spent most of his time at Cambridge, you know, at least on two separate teaching occasions. You know, he, he started there as a uh, student of Russell's. He tried to uh, work with Frege and then he went to Russell and then, uh, and then he left and became a teacher and taught in the mountain schools of Austria for seven years before he went back to Cambridge in nine, before Frank Ramsey inveigled him to bring him back to, that, to, uh, to Cambridge in 1929. Um, and and, and uh, Wittgenstein, um, <coughs> Monty Python says, you know, Wittgenstein was a very swine. Um, actually, in actual fact, um, you know, I, I, I don't think he drank beer. Um, you know, he was uh, a very, came from a very aristocratic family and, uh, you know, his father, you know, his father, Ludwig, uh, um, father's, uh, um, was second only to the Rothschilds in, uh, in Austria and uh, Wittgenstein famously gave away his fortune. So, you know, he's quite an interesting character and I became really quite obsessed with him. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background here, but um, um, I did a philosophy science degree. Uh, my, my first degree, is a, uh, I was a, I'm a, I'm a failed poet. You know, I did English literature and then I did a master's degree, uh, an honors degree in, in geography. Um, actually, I was taught by a Welsh philosopher, uh, a Welsh geographer of, um, of underdevelopment, Keith Buchanan, who taught Maoism back in, back in the 70s. <laughs> the transformation of the Chinese earth, actually, which was a very a brilliant book because he, he spent a lot of time you know, learning Chinese and quoting Chinese poetry. Um, but I went to um, I went to University of Canada to do a philosophy of science degree, and why I mention that's important is because uh, there has been a, a sort of thread in this conversation for me going back to that time, and you know so um, um, I I did philosophy of science, and of course uh, I have to mention the fact that Karl Popper. Uh, took a position, the first position, professor of philosophy at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand from 1937 to 43. He wrote his classic work, The Open Society and Its Enemies, volumes one and two, which he called as his war effort. Um, he hated New Zealand. Uh, the, the head of the department there really, I mean, he was, he was um, super careful about what he said, but basically they loaded him up with a lot of teaching. Uh, they, they didn't recognize his work the Logic of Scientific Discovery, which had been published in, in Germany uh, and then um, in 1934 and then republished later as The Logic of Scientific Discovery in 1959. Um, and <coughs> I, did, um, I, did the, I did the philosophy of science um, looking at, uh, looking at uh, Karl Popp, looking really at early um, Wittgenstein and Tractatus, Frege, Russell, uh, logical atomism, <coughs> and then you know the Vienna Circle, uh, the reception of the Vienna Circle, and um, and and then you know uh, this move to um, to Popper, who was also on the fringe of the Vienna Circle, and um, and he had this link to um, to Canterbury, so you know he was a very distinguished scholar that um, finally left in 1943. Uh, helped through um, Wittgenstein's cousin Frederick von Hayek, who occupied a position at the London School of Economics and, and helped uh, uh, Popper to edit his work on the Open Society. And then he arranged, he really helped to bring um, Popper back to the LSE. Um, now, I, this is uh, this first quote here the loss of faith in science is the paradigm of rationality. And, uh, and in philosophy is a foundational discipline concerned to provide universal st standards of rationality valid for all actual and possible claims of knowledge has forced an re-evaluation re of the nature of rationality. 
Now, um, this was really the topic of my PhD thesis back in, I finished in 1984. And um, and that, at that point, um, I was I became uh, really obsessed. I would I would, I would say with uh, Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, uh, and in particular, um, I was interested in the way that it was the basis for a kind of historical shift away from these universal this universal conception of um, of uh, rationality to a language dependent nature of belief constituted through language game, what, you know, Wittgenstein's concept of language games, um, and underwritten um, by a concept of cultural practice, I suppose, that really led to the social studies of science that took place with the philosophers of science that I think are influenced by Wittgenstein. I will come to them. But I wanted to talk about, just briefly here, mention the groundlessness of belief that Wittgenstein was talking about. You know, he says this, uh, this um, it makes this comment, giving grounds, justifying the evidence, comes to an end, he says. Uh, but the end is not certain propositions striking us as immediately as true. It's not kind of seeing on our part, it's an acting which lies at the bottom of the language game. So, you know, here's the groundlessness of, of belief. I, I could spend a lot of time talking about this, but <laughs> I know there are, there are quite a few um, slides here that I want to move through. I, I, I think that his unheralded, uh, only recently um, discovered, you know, um, the um, amazing uh, book on called Uncertainty that he, um, uh, that based on notes that he made sort of like 18 months before he died in 1951, uh, where you know, he was making this case that all doubt is embedded in underlying beliefs, and he uses this as a way of defeating radical skepticism. I'm not going to read out the quote from uh, On Certainty, which you can see there, but <clears throat> I think what was important about On Certainty was that it was an investigation of epistemic practices. Again, an actual looking and investigation of phenomenological process and something he called hinge, hinge propositions. So these were deep propositions that were themselves um, irrational commitments that were themselves not open to systematic evaluation. And, and this was a really kind of a, something of a breakthrough, I think. Um, you know, and <coughs> Wittgenstein, he challenged the very strong claims of logical positivism uh, that considered only natural science as genuine knowledge. You know, in 1929, when he was issued, you know, when he was uh, able to come back to the Vienna Circle by Frank Ramsey, the brilliant mathematician that died so early, um, he. Um, <coughs> He went into the room with great philosophers like Carnap and uh, Hans Reichenbach and those philosophers that actually populated the philosophy departments, many uh, Jewish uh, philosophers that left uh, as German escapee Jews to, to, go, to, uh, to go to America uh, and to carry the beliefs of the kind of like the analytic philosophy revolution. There, he went into that room. There, he took the Indian poet. Am I saying his word, uh, his name correctly? Tangori. Tangori. Uh, he read <laughs> with his back to the crowd. He read Tangori's Tangori's poetry. Tagore. Tagore. So you know, Tagore. He read his poetry, and he would say, "Let me say, um, this was the only non-Western influence on Wittgenstein's thinking." Uh, but I think at the end of that, Carnap turned around to the others and said. I don't think he's one of us. Right? By that time, he'd, he'd changed. He was no longer uh, a verificationist. He was no longer interested in the moral, you know, moral schlicks uh, manifesto to do with logical empiricism. So, uh, and I've written a few books over the years uh, going back on, 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 on Wittgenstein. One most recently coming out quite soon. Um, uh, this year, actually, although it's 2020, um, which really, uh, this invitation really inspired me to do some work on techno science and, 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 uh, and Wittgenstein. And a work that I did um, back in 1995 
on Jean-François Lyotard, uh, who wrote the foreword for that book. Um, uh, after 18 months of corresponding with him, he would always write in longhand and in French. Um, so it was a bit of a struggle for me to um, to communicate with him. But um, so there is a bit of a history for this, um, and I think uh, a link here uh, with uh, Jean-François Lyotard, um, his understanding of anti-foundationalism, um, the link to philosophers of science who were really interested um, in following and, and looking at actual practices in science. And I, I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Hansen, um, Feyerabend, and Tullman, Rorty, and of course Thomas Kuhn. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this is the, another quote from my 1984 thesis. It was never published. I never had the uh, gumption to publish this thesis, and I don't, I don't really want too many people reading it, but uh, this sentence seems to be all right. The movement, I said then, can be characterized in historical terms as the move away from single, universal, formal model of rationality, motivated by uh, considerations of logic, to informal and historical models that more closely approximate rationalities employed by agents in the act of construction of social reality. So that's the view that under, under wrote, I guess, uh, you know, this um, Wittgensteinian philosophy of science. And I think what was instrumental for me in my understanding was the way in which Lietar understood Wittgenstein's cultural pessimism, the fact that he came out of fin de siècle Vienna that he was really, as Yannick said later, he was a philosopher of the Austrian counter-enlightenment. You know? and, and I think there's something very clear and, 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 and true about that. So you see here, uh, Leotard says, you know, uh, that um, Wittgenstein's language games was seen to be, by him, a response to the ethico-political demands follow, you know, following the loss of innocence in a time diseased by language, he says, and dominated by capitalist uh, industrial techno-science. So this, the, this is where I think um, my reading back in 84 started. So enough about the uh, autobiography, the accidental aspect of that. Let's turn to the concept of um, techno-science and techno-politics. And you see uh, here is a, a, a range of ways in which the label is being used by institutes and books and so on. Um, I want to go back here, techno-science, because it's a term used by Lieta, uh, and he's aware of the way in which uh, Heidegger uh, really begins to invert the traditional applied science model of technology to understand Western metaphysics uh, physics as a form of techni. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not going to go work my way through um, all of Heidegger in this respect, that, you know, it's a glancing blow, but I think um, the important thing for us here at the moment is that, you know, in our time, being has the character of a technological framework, you know, and, and Heidegger said that in a number of conversations, not only as lectures on, on technology, famous lectures on technology. So, um, you know, the, 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 the ultimate danger for Heidegger writing, you know, um, you know um, well before the, the invention of the uh, internet, was to say that human beings will also interpret themselves as raw material within this uh, this uh, framework uh, of standing of standing reserve. So, um, I think this is my first one of my first papers, Techno Science Rationality at the University, published in 19, 1989. I revisit this because it refers to the techno science that is the basis for this talk. The legitimation of science, he says, uh, this is uh, Lietar, it's alleged humanist emancipatory potential has fallen away to reveal knowledge and power, two sides of the same question. You know this question. In the computer age, the question of knowledge now, as he says, more than ever a question of government. I, I don't know whether I'll use that word government in this context. I would say, you know, Foucault's governmentality is probably better here because, you know, we are, we are talking 
now about a form of technology which is extra state. You know, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, Google and Facebook and their uh, Chinese equivalents, Alibaba and WeChat, we talk about you know these ma major major companies that have no physical location and are very hard to tax in any country at all, and they have a kind of mobility. Um, so. <coughs> Leotard, I think what he gets right about this, and when he's charting the transition of Western societies to post-industrial age, is to focus on scientific knowledge. And he says, the leading sciences in technology after Wittgenstein, cybernetics, telematics, informatics, the growth of computer languages, he says, are all significantly language-based. And they've transformed the two principal functions of knowledge, when he talks about, uh, of course, transmission of knowledge of acquired learning and research. And, you know, the question of the transformation of research is only something now that we really, and the Australian Academy of Science uh, is turning their, their, their um, head to. The question here, no universal principle of rationality in which to understand science, there are new lang languages, new languages, and, and he mentions Wittgenstein's symbolism of, cal of, um, of chemistry, infinitesimal calculus, and then 50 years on, this is Leotard writing in 1979, the growth of machine languages, game theory, musical notation, genetic code, phonological structures, and so on. And of course now, um, we're only beginning to scratch the surface about algorithmics, um, in particular, game, number, information, complexity, probability theory, computer science algorithms, including sorting and, you know, um, recursion, graph theory, <laughs> genetic uh, uh, algorithms, and life is evolving, uh, as evolving, itself an evolving uh, um, algorithm, the rise of social algorithms, um, leading us to something we might talk about is data science. We can, we can unpack that a little bit further. And also, uh, you know, the notion of algorithmic capitalism when we talk about high frequency trading and uh, the way in which that is, uh, that's really taken off, um, you know, be one of the principal reasons what might say is the volatility of this algorithmic, the buy algorithm, the sell algorithm that led to the global financial crisis in, 19, uh, in 2008. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's a, um, I, I could go into that in great detail, I wrote a book on that, but I won't do that at the moment, but algorithmic capitalism here, we see a kind of like a volatility of the market that we see uh, even today. So, <coughs> Leotard drives, it points us to the internal limitation of formal systems. So he says, you know, in terms of properties required of the syntax, of any formal system, that is consistency, completeness, decidability, independence of axioms. It's possible to generalize from Gödel's incompleteness theorem that all formal systems have internal limitations. And the shift, he says, from the principle of a universal meta language to one of plurality is at the heart of breaking from a universal uh, rationality uh, with its you know, classical metaphysics. Um, so, the emergence of the concept. So, you know, I know that, that, that Jean-François Lyotard used the term techno-science. So, so did Jacques Derrida. Um, you know, um, and, but I was unaware at the time that it did have a genealogical history. I'm going back to the Belgian philosopher Thay here, who indicates he first used the term in the mid-1970s. Um, in um, a paper that he wrote, um, that he f finally published in 1978, he wanted to raise some practical questions that were hived off, he said, by linguistic philosophers sealed themselves from reality, and also from the technologization and mathematicization of contemporary science. So he traces the prehistory of the term to Francis Bacon, I think that's a bit of a stretch myself. And then he goes more precisely, I think, to Gaston Bachelard, um, the new scientific spirit, you know, spirit in 19, 1939, 1934, I should say, 
uh, that places the new scientific spirit under the influence of mathematical and technical operation. I think for the French philosophy of techno science, that is a pretty important kind of comment to make. So, and he reserves the term techno science in relation to questions concerning, quote, the patentability of living organisms. Exemplified in transgenic mice, used as a model for research on the genesis of certain cancers. And he acknowledges the work of people in Latin America uh, and also, of course, of um, the feminist Donna Haraway. So he also makes a, queer, uh, makes a comment about technoscience, when we're talking about technoscience to technopolitics, really, that focuses on the question of what will become of the human being in a million years. Um, I'm not going to read that to you, but you know he's talking about a range of issues that we, um, you know, in ethics, the development of bioethics, um, but also in many other fields. Um, I want to say education figures in this largely because we're talking about uh, the development of um, cognosciences and the development of um, uh, a range of cognosciences that are in the let me say laboratory stage at the moment, fostered by the National Science, um, the, the National Science Foundation that I'm going to be talking about in a little while. So, but there is a clear link here between techno, techno politics on one hand and biotechnology on the other. So, uh, you trace the literature, you see Edwards and Heck talk about techno politics as hybrids of technical systems and political practices that produce new forms of power and agency. I like that definition. And I think it gives us something help, helpful to work with. Um, and he expand, you know, Hughes expands the scope of techno politics by focusing on innovations in nanobiotechnologies. So he's talking about these coming techno -politic, uh, political conflicts be fought over the development, regulation, accessibility of human advancement, en enhancement technologies, and will bring the, to the table fundamentally different conceptions of citizenship, rights, and policy. So we have, we have here um, some early statements in the 2000s that begins to flesh out a concept of technoscience as a kind of public reaction to many of the new uh, digital technologies that are being employed. Technology, technopolitics as openness and also as citizen uh, empowerment. A strategic way, as Kellner says, a strategic way of citizen empowerment that could become an arm of struggle. And, and it has, I don't use that word lightly, I think that when you talk about forms of citizen science, for instance, you, you know, and the Australian Academy of Science has released a big report on citizen science. Uh, you can talk about um, this question um, of openness uh, as a paradigm of technopolitics in open science, in citizen, new citizen science and open education. And I mentioned open science publishing here because you know, the plan from Science Europe, the S plan, I don't know whether you've heard of this concept, the S plan is mandated by next year is that anything that receives public funding by way of research, we're talking only about $9 billion worth, of course, in Europe, uh, has to be publicly available. Yeah, there's a mad scramble going on at the moment, the publisher saying, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to... How are we going to maintain these very high prices? Price gouging. <coughs> California, University of California, split with Elsevier recently. So this, this is a big deal. Uh, open science publishing. Open science publishing. Um, and the Science Europe S plan uh, mandated by 2020. It's certainly going to hit Australia, it's going to hit the Western world, and, uh, and it's going to have a big effect on any research, any research at all, that is publicly funded, has to be publicly available. And that means that people now have to build, uh, you know, as scientists uh, have been doing for quite some time, they will build their publishing um, fee. 
into the research budget and the proposals that they're developing. I would like to spend more time about that, but um, I, I think um, also the concept that techno politics is a kind of public politics that's talking about the tactical <coughs> strategic use of, of digital tools for organization, for communication, and for the social movements. So, a first, a first stab at the question here. My first preliminary uh, you know, map of techno-politics here. I think I should say a shift from big, big science uh, to big data, to big tech, to a kind of bioinformationalism. Uh, and I'm talking about big data-driven science. People say the end of theory, the creation of data-driven rather than knowledge-driven science. Discovery machines, uh, this is uh, the Australian, Acad Australian Academy of Science, uh, their work on discovering machines, big, big data in Australian research, preparing Australia for uh, um, digital, uh, digital future and bioscience, this, uh, this is a report in progress from your academy uh, at the moment. Um, the public virtues of kind of openness around citizen empowerment, particularly and so, you know, particularly with um, uh, ecology, you know, where you're using, where the local community is empowered to develop um, monitoring of air quality, of water quality, of, you know, changes to gemophology, uh, you know, uh, to the, you know, particularly water, because, you know, this is a, a kind of a kind of politics around water in Australia, which is emerging, which is quite uh, interesting uh, when you talk about climate change per se. Um, let me say also surveillance capitalism, use of per personal data, of dataism per se. That is, we're talking about, um, you know, information flow is the supreme value. The undermining of democracy, I mentioned Cambridge Analytica, and I don't need to tell anybody about that here in this room, I don't think. Biocapitalism, bioethics, body hacking, and body hacking here. What I, um, this is my term, platform ontologies, um, being, as a technological framework, open to bio-digital becoming and gene-drive uh, gene technology. I mean, in here, your academy of um, Australian Academy of Science had published a report on this in 2017. I talk about, um, I think it's important to talk about, when you talk about techno science and you're talking about new technologies, we have to understand its relationship to a kind of algorithmic capitalism, uh, more broadly speaking. Because it takes, it removes many of the decisions from researchers and embeds them in technical systems. Uh, we have, um, you know, uh, let me say, a single global technical system emerging with parallel twin structures, both Chinese and American. And the question of education and technological unemployment is now also a central concern for, you know, Australian government. Um, and let me say, <laughs> um, last but not least, the cognitive sciences and uh, cyborgization around concepts of cognitive efficiency. I, and I, I, I just recently published a book uh, with some friends on technological unemployment. Uh, I think it came out uh, this, this year um, and it's something I've been, um, I've been following through for quite some time. Here, here are some, here are some Australian sources from Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre is talking about uh, being born or built. Um, and robotization, of course, in, in the Australian economy. And more recently, the Australian Council of Learned Academies, is that right? Um, uh, the key findings of this report, it was uh, made on the 21st, 31st of July this year. Uh, you know, and it's talking about artificial intelligence and opportunity to improve our well-being. Uh, I highlight one section. I, there, these are all the key findings from that report. Successful development and implementation of AI will require a broad range of new skills and enhanced capacities to span the humanities, the arts, social science, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines. So, you know, we say, you know, to what extent do we? <laughs> Do our curriculum actually reflect this at the moment? Uh, how would it change? 
And I think that it also talks, you know, this uh, report that's come out about um, uh, uh, the attempt to bring together uh, of the major stakeholders in public discussions and also a, as a regulatory body uh, in academia, private public sectors, that they say provide a massive skills and institutional leadership to develop AI technologies. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Proactive engagement, consultation, ongoing communication with the, pub with the public. So I think that notion of technopolitics that I'm pushing here has, is reflected in the, the reports of Australian Academy of Sciences. And we could go into more detail on those. But let me move to bioinformational capitalism. I, I'm going to say this, um, this is a, an essay, actually, that, that I published in Thesis 11. I thought that I should really um, mention it in this context. Um, so, you know, the idea was to theorize uh, an essay that builds on the literature of biocapitalism or informationalism, to develop a concept of bioinformational capitalism in order to articulate an emergent form of capitalism that is self-renewing in the sense that it can change and renew the material basis for life and capital as well as program itself. Now, I was very influenced by Craig Venter, who uh, heads up, you know, he was the, you know, the venture capitalist uh, that was first due to um, using a, some say an illicit approach here to uh, the human genome, to um, map the human genome. Uh, and he did it, so you know, let me say, you know, uh, 2012, he, did, uh, he, he had created new life for the first time historically, uh, a year or so earlier. And by new life, what I mean is that he'd taken uh, an algorithm uh, produced in bioinformatics, which was uh, 19 million letters long, you know, made, made up of the appropriate amino acids and so on. And he, he, he'd taken that and planted it in a host bacterium cell, and, and it was able to self-replicate. So we call, he called that first creation of life. He called it Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Cynthia. Uh, and you know, this, was the, this is the first time that human beings have ever done that. Uh, and, now, and now he's heading up a company called Longevity Incorporated, where he's applying bio technology to extending the life of America's very rich people who can afford the, the appropriate um, you know, um, gene therapies. Um, so here we are. Um, I found that fascinating and you know, following Craig Venter after that has been quite interesting for me. So I want to talk about bio-digital capitalism and biopolitics here. The development of a new biology has been possible through the application of informatics to biology, and more recently of new biology to informatics using data intensive, so-called big data, to develop an EVO-DEVO uh, develop program that integrates, integrates biological theory across the hierarchy of life, involves development of dialectic information and biology informatics as the, science, the major driving scientific logic and rationality that leads to the biologization of the digital in the long term and informatization of, of biology. So this genomic capitalism does represent a significant stage of global biocapitalism uh, that when it's, when it's harnessed with the new generation of information processing itself organically enhanced comprises a kind of new bioinformationalism. Um, I, I, I was thinking about that 2012, and <coughs> I, I went back to review the claims of synthetic biology, you know, in this sense. Um, and this is uh, Dyson, you know, um, the first quotation there is from Bison, um, who's talking about biology becoming the paradigm, biotechnology becoming the paradigm that replaces physics as the major funded kind of scientific research that takes place in the United States. Um, and, you know, uh, here we have this kind of, we have entered the digital age of synthetic biology with biotechnology, advanced computer 
information systems converging where we can design gene sequences, connect them in more complicated ways, insert them into the DNA of a developing organism, resulting in life that are not naturally evolved in the global ecosystem. So you know, this, is, this is also part of a kind of new ecology that we've got to be aware of that's happening uh, with, uh, with, with plants, with agriculture, with seeds, uh, you know, with companies like Monsanto and so on. But as part of this as well, we have to take a note of neurotechnologies and the advance of neurotechnologies. Uh, because uh, we, we're talking about um, uh, this kind of new combination that combines these insights into the human brain with advanced technolog technological development and brain imaging, brain computer inf inf in in uh, interfaces, neurofeedback platforms, brain simulation, other neuro enhancement applications. And I, I'm not going to actually talk about quantum computing. There's a paper that we did, my wife did, did some uh, recently, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to move on to the, the deep convergence and a new kind of scientific, uh, techno scientific synergy here. Uh, again, um, let's say, let's get to the meat of the matter. We're talking about the National Science Foundation in the United States. They've published a number of reports on the convergence of what they call NBC uh, IC technologies, including um, you know, uh, <coughs> chief application areas. Expanding human cognition is one of the really huge priorities in this, with its, um, the idea of strengthening national security, unifying science and education is also a very strong um, national foundation goal. And Bainbridge and Rocco um, are talking about uh, you know, these are the people, the scientists have been driving this, a new kind of scientific unity at the nano, nano, the nano scale, the nano level. So the three, the three sources that actually structured this evolving discourse are three different reports that were released um, in the early 2000s. A Converging Technologies for Improving Human Performance, released in 2002. The report of the uh, EU, Converging Technology Shaping the Future of European Societies, 2004. The big down from genomes to atoms are uh, talking about convergent technologies. You know, um, these are the sources. This is the new paradigm, the global educational paradigm for the future advocated by NSF, nanobioinfocognote paradigm. <laughs> um, um, and here are the, these are seen as technologies for the next stage of the, inf of the knowledge societies. And you see the way in which they all uh, figure uh, and uh, devolve to looking at enhancing, enhancing human performance. It's a very interesting kind of, uh, kind of view. I think they need some, uh, I'm not volunteering, but, um, and there are a few people that wouldn't call me a philosopher, but I'm not, I'm not um, you know, I think they need a few philosophers on this, on this panel. But at the nano level, beginning to link information and biology at the nano level, and then apply it to cognitive sciences, this is a kind of frightening version for me um, of the, the nano scientific convergence that you see here, this is one of the model for natural convergence on two dimensions that focuses on the emerging cogno, the cogno sciences from National Science Foundation. And <coughs> you were also talking about uh, a kind of result of the clustering exercise that where these converging society, you know, technologies um, are the hub that relate to human machine interfaces, neuro brain enhancement, physical enhancement, biomedicine, and so on. So uh, here, here's one of the early ones, Bainbridge and Rocco that I mentioned. Um, fields are progressively merging step by step at an accelerating rate. Um, they constitute a major phase change in the nature of science and technology. I find that an extremely interesting statement to make, an extremely interesting claim, uh, especially in view of the fact there's not a lot of critical literature around these claims that are being made. Uh, so um, they say principles for convergence, techno, con convergence techno science, uh, evolutionary processes of convergence, system logic, deduction and 
in decisions. Um, and of course, I highlighted the one to do with education here to identify educational possibilities for a new integrative science, technology, and society that require convergent technologies. What happens then when 21st century technologies converge? This is uh, again still National Science Foundation. Unity of nature at the national nanoscale. Nano but number five here, unifying science and education. We, we've seen in some ways this kind of process take place globally uh, with the promotion of um, um, STEM uh, education, improving health and physical capabilities and so on. Um, here's more, um, a more uh, uh, graphical view of it, the four central fields of convergence. You see um, the way in which cognitive neuroscience, computational neuroscience, nanomedicine, artificial intelligence are really, uh, you know, um, important to neurobrain enhancement to the relationship to uh, um, robots, intelligent software devices, human machine interfaces and so on, and lang language and image recognition and so on. I'll leave you to read that. Uh, here's, a, here's another one really, 2007, visions and realities of converging technologies. Here again, uh, where you have uh, a summary of the distance between visions and state of research and main com combinations here. Um, expected benefit from interdisciplinary cooperation. You see here um, synthetic bio, neuro brain uh, enhancement uh, and so on. Um, um, and you know, they also publish the timeline for converging in BIC technologies. So you know, next year you will all be able to uh, communicate and cooperate profitably across traditional barriers of culture, language, distance and um, professional specialization. Wow. Well, <laughs> I mean, let me say, the, uh, the naivety, the naivety of a bunch of scientists making that claim is extraordinary. These are among the best scientists in the world. Um, the human body will be more durable, healthier, more energetic, easier to repair, more resistant to many kinds of stress, you'll be happy to know. Um, bi <laughs> biological, <laughs> Peter, uh, biological threats, aging processes. All right. Hey, um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but let's, um, you know, the promise of outer space here will finally realise by means of efficient launch vehicles, vehicles, robotic construction of extraterrestrial bases, and so on. Um, you know, it, that makes fascinating re, 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 um, reading. And it's kind of like even better than sort of like science fact. Well, it poses as science, science fact. It's more kind of interesting than science fiction. But let's go to, I'm getting closer uh, to the end here, but you, you know, um, we will uh, stop before breakfast. Um, but let's have a look at the cognitive technosciences. Um, and, you know, we're talking here about the imaging of neuronal pathways. Is that your brain, Michael? <laughs> That's one of them, yes. That's the, um, the reptilian brain. <laughs> the reptilian brain. Um, yeah, so, you know, here we are um, talking about, I think, out of waves of technology, you know, making a distinction between foundational, transformational, emergent, and converging, converging technologies. Um, and I think, uh, if I can, you know, move to the, the last one, education, that fundamental institution, is key area or place of struggle between competing versions of a future of society, not only, but only uh, often after installation, <laughs> after installation after the decisions have been taken, after, you know, the new computers have been issued and so on. And I think we would say that the NSF says the cognitive technologies are the least developed of these emerging technologies, I mean, techno-science, okay? And that's where they're putting, their, they're putting their effort there. These are conversion technologies purported to drive the next stage of knowledge society as a parallel in the future. Um, and they say, look, of all the embit fields, the cognitive science is the least mature, but for this reason it holds the great promise. Multidisciplinary conversions of cognitive psychology, linguistics, 
uh, cultural anthropo neuroscience, artificial intelligence, computer science. You know, already we've seen, I, I, I can't remember who I spoke to here who said, I said, where's philosophy now? No, no philosophy, he said, we're talking about positive psychology. We have, we're, we're talking about the growth of po positive psychology. We have, we have positions in positive psychology, but none in philosophy. <laughs> okay, um, so <clears throat> this was 2016, the Growing Conversion Research at the National Science Foundation. So they say it's a means of solving vexing research problems. Uh, complex problems focusing on societal needs, um, and it's looking at you know disciplines. Trans, we've seen, we've heard this before, haven't we? Uh, in the humanities and social science, transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. It's the closest to transdisciplinary research, which was viewed historically as the pinnacle of evolutionary integration across different disciplines. And of course, they mention uh, you know the importance of nanotechnology in these new emerging cognitive uh, cognitive uh, technologies. You know um, the way in which the key structures of the human nervous system exist at the nano scale, um, and that nanotechnology is enabling a convergence of other science technology, the first time in human history including uh, cognitive science with an emphasis on education and learning sciences and the learning sciences. Um, connecting education and learning to biology, to the brain, and also to information science. So, you know, just, you know, you can relax. Um, we've got it all sorted here. And um, the ethos and emphasis prioritized at the national level through the establishment of these national learning centers. I, I want to ask here, you know, we're talking about intelligent technologies and development of the internet and so on. I, I want to just focus just briefly now, without being too cynical, on, on the downside. And I think we can say um, here, um, when we look at this, this work called um, Globalization, Biosecurity and the Future of, uh, of Life Sciences, which is, comes out of the American Academy of Sciences, they say the intriguing feature of nanoscale is that it's the scale on which biological systems are built, build their structural components. Um, and biochemistry is kind of like, is a nano, a nano, a nanoscale phenomena. Uh, even more intriguingly, they say it's a key property of these biological structural components, including, of course, the DNA's double helix, which is a form of self-assembly. So, I went through and, and, and discovered the National Learning S uh, Centres established by the NSF. Um, these are all um, have been established in the last little while. Uh, they came out of that emphasis on cognitive sciences, the cognitive science, and they're all uh, in excess of 20 million. 20 million foundations through um, through the National Science Foundation. So. Um, I, I don't have I don't have really time to go through each one of those, um, but you know you're most welcome to the slides if you're interested in following through on those national learning centres. The post-human analysis um, is such that cognitive science emerges as this basis for enhanced global competition in the global knowledge economy. That's where the investment should be made on this basis. Um, and, um, you know, we're talking about post-biological techno-science. Um, my questions, um, these are pretty obvious questions, I think, in relation to techno-politics, which is the concept that I'm pushing here around. Can the employment of intelligent technology in the service of education resist integration into the, into the, the new global circuit? You know, because we used to have a Kantian, Cartesian language of autonomy and rights uh, around individuals. And now we're talking, we're talking about a kind of integrated circuit, people being integrated into a circuit. What does it do to, well, what does it do to that language <laughs> that we were talking about last night in terms of international law based on rights? What does it do to it? Well, it says that that language is inadequate we keep using it, it's inadequate for what we're talking about here. The claims that intelligent technology is a slow form of violence, re-scripting the nervous system is one of the uh, big claims. 
which in turn affects physical well-being, international, uh, interpersonal relationships, and by extension, the fabric of society. In national uh, technology, changing the brain wiring diagram and re-scripting nervous systems in a way in which intelligent technology is, they say, numbing the biological self, numbing the biological self. Okay. Um, so there are a series of claims here, very important claims. The erasure of the body, the irregulation of the, mo the, the, the emotion, the canalization of the senses are terms that are used here. Um, the socio-cultural and neurobiological impacts of, of intelligent technology. And on the one hand, we have these, this argument about the utopian, <coughs> you know, the utopian te technical immortalists. Uh, here the name of you know, Kevin Kelly, Jason Silver. But the question is, are we being robbed of our autonomy? Is it, is it, does it make sense to actually phrase it in that sense if you're talking about global integrated circuits? Part of that. Um, are we becoming less human as we are integrated into the circuitry of fifth generation resurgent, um, resurgent cybernetic capitalism? I, I mean, this goes back to the kind of worries that that Heidegger had <laughs> you know, when he was doing those lectures on technology. And <clears throat> when we look at the neurological effects, uh, it's, um, let me say, um, it's, uh, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult area. And there are no real answers here. There are some suggestions. Um, let me say, uh, here's one. Uh, developmental psychologists, the constant use of technology, see the empirical scientist, is hijacking one's ability to form high level re meaning within the environment. Nicholas Carr, you know, the internet is rerouting re re the uh, neurological pathways to our brain. Well, we, 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 know, we know there's actually quite a lot of research that does reveal uh, the way in which, you know, historically reading, the, they call it the reading brain. When, you, when human beings began to read for the first time, became good readers, it changed neurological pathways in the brain, changed the brain. Uh, now they say, well, what about the internet? You know, what about screen logics? Well, yes, <laughs> the question is, they're changing them too. In what, in what respect? Well, you know, um, I, I don't think in the literature that I've read, there's enough room to entertain the counterfactual, the counterhypothesis, the, the counterhypothesis here. Um, so let me see. I mentioned some of the evidence from clinical studies here. Pamela Hurst, uh, uh, Pietra, uh, this is 2007, from a journal um, called Pediatrics, um, mentions the game, the internet gaming disorder, which was defined in the DSM-4 of the American Psychiatric Association as early as 2011, a persistent and recurring use of internet to engage in games, often with other players, leading to clinically significant impairment or distress. You know, uh, Peter, you, you were talking about uh, social media, the social media global brain, uh, and what it brings to the surface and um, how, how trivial uh, it might be. It tells you how to make up your face with new eyeshadow, uh, and you have uh, you know a couple hundred thousand <laughs> followers to do that. Um, I, I used it tonight. You, re you see that? Um, you see here. Uh, here are the names of the paper: Digital Life and Youth World Being, Social Connectedness, Empathy, Narcissism, Anxiety, Depression in Children, and so on. I mean, uh, my grandchildren, uh, my, my 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 our two sons here regulate very precisely the amount of time that the, the, our grandchildren can spend uh, in front of the computer. And, and one of them, one of them, I mean, this is an anecdotal, of course, only, you know, gives the most incredible uh, tantrums when he's parted from the computer. You know, it's impo impossible. You can't reason with him. He's, got, he's gone. Uh, and I, I hear that this is quite common. So, <coughs> Platform ontologies. So we're on to the last bit here, uh, a term that I coined, how algorithms know us better than we know ourselves. And I'm talking about here um, those technologies that record massively large collection of signals 
that are signed in Europe gives away free, as free data, during the course of their relationship with the likes of Google and Facebook. Um, and increasing to, increasingly to algorithmic driven apps that tune us up for better health, fitness, motivation, mood prediction, enhancement, i.e. the algorithm knows us better than we know ourselves. Hmm? They can provide more biological data about how the body behaves. You can have a watch on here that gives you, you know, um, the number of steps you take per day. It can give you the recommended health regime, your diet, blah, blah, you know. I mean, it's um, uh, the track, and this is the interesting thing here for me, the tracking and hacking the body through these new onto platforms that really define our subjectivity. And, um, and when we, rescind, uh, we, we, we surrender <laughs> to these onto platforms, we do so of our own free will as part of that deep code. So, uh, you know, we say the cyborg has been used by Donna Howell and a lot of other people here. Uh, I'm going back to human enhancement through the cyborg. This is uh, a positive, this is a positive take on cyborg enhancement. Prosthetic organs, evolution of cyborg with emotional aspects of human function. Three, they make use of abilities to alter products of genes and incite new elements. Four, represents the transgenerational fusion uh, of humans and, techno and, and technology. Uh, Cyborg 5, <coughs> the ultimate articulation of the human, human um, machine interface, brain, brain mind, may be linked to devices of media and thus um, no need for, for the body for, for any kind of experience, you know. Um, <coughs> Uh, and I've, I've written some, some, these are some articles I've written about, about that aspect, but we are back here to control, manipulation, illicit use. A kind of datarism and convergent technologies which have long proved their susceptibility to control, to manipulation, to closet data, data science, to nefarious use by, let's say, Cambridge Analytica. You know, the use of 87 uh, million Facebook um, followers to, to change the Brexit result, <laughs> you know, Britain and the erosion of democracy here. You know, this is part of technopolitics. This is a very important concern for technopolitics. Uh, the supreme value of cognitive efficiency requires we participate in labor endlessly, that we give away our data for free, and that we help to institutionalize this one trillion dollar, or soon to be, data monopolies of surveillance capitalism. Uh, you know, and <coughs> it's very interesting because the Australian government, you know, has this, you know, the, the digital platforms inquiry that came out in June uh, last last month, right? Um, here, here are the the chapter: the rise of digital platforms, uh, market power. Regulatory, you know, platform frameworks for digital um, uh, for media, uh, choice of quality of journalism, um, consumers uh, addressing emerging harm from scams, artificial intelligence, other new new technology. Um, you know, I, I must say I found it quite hopeful looking at. This looking at the Australian context for an awareness of these issues. And so here's the overview they give. Um, they're talking here, until recently they say, there's been very little reflection on the possibilities of digital platforms and marketplace in which they operate. Right? And I say, but think global education markets, consumer-driven education. What does it mean for that? Um, in Australia, another jurisdiction, questions uh, about the impact of digital platforms, stretching from alleged anti-competitive conduct to privacy concerns, from disparity in media regulation to copyright issues. The ubiquity, then, of Google and Facebook platforms have placed them in a privileged position. They act as gateways to reaching Australian consumers. Mm. Um, and the profound effect of digital platforms of media markets, which requires uh, very careful consideration. Um, I, I, I don't understand why it focuses only on news and news generation. 
when I want to say, look, what, what, about, what about public education? What about public science? And what about, what about university research, <laughs> which is a good one, uh, if you see that as a global public good? Um, these are quite important. I think the concern for the digital public good, which is the basis for a kind of techno-politics that I'm advocating, um, and you know, um, this is the this comes out of the report as well. The way which user data enables digital platforms to target or personalise opportunities. Um, you know, does access to user data give digital platforms a competitive advantage in entering the market, the new markets, in, co in competition with their consumer? Do consumers make informed choices? Can collected da data be used in ways that harm? Society. I think that's probably quite a good note on which to end up because I'm, I'm ending on an Australian uh, report that's just been released this year and it sort of sums up some of the, some of the aspects um, that, I, that I mentioned. So um, let me, uh, you know, this is well before breakfast, so uh, let me, let me um, end there. And, uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah, can, absolutely, you, of course. You, can, no, you, you want the water as well? <laughs> you can keep the microphone, no, no, no problem, because we're we going to open it to the floor. Uh -huh, well, sure. I think... Hi again. Uh, well, now opening the floor to questions, comments. Uh, if you have a comment, uh, please be short. Questions of all kinds that have been Yes. Um, so Fascinating, thank you very much. My name is Gerardo. Uh, I work as an educator at Latrobe, and a lot of what you're talking about is really quite interesting. Um, I found the focus on cognition as a logical exercise quite problematic. A lot of what's out there totally effaces the emotional side of humanity. Uh, and in particular, I, there's that moral tale written so many years ago by Euripides, the Bacchus. Are we destined to go crazy or mad? following down this path that focuses only on logical thought, so-called, and cognitive, cognitive thinking, rather than considering it as part of an emotional process, which cannot be destroyed without destroying humanity. So I just thought what your, you know, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, um, actually, it's a very good question, because I think that um, when you look at the philosophers of mind, they want to talk, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about how do we escape from the Cartesian cognate, cog, co, cogito? Yep. <clears throat> how do we escape from that cultural mistake that was the basis for modern philosophy <laughs> in the European West? You know, that was uh, Descartes' subjective turn that he took with the emphasis on the cogito and so on. And I think we're still living out the consequences of that, and you know, slowly uh, the more enlightened uh, and more enlightened philosophers and psychologists are talking about a kind of embodied cognition. They're talking about the, the brain uh, more, much more as kind of like um, a part of a physiological network uh, that includes, uh, you know, emotions. Emotions. So they talk about they talk about the five E's. Uh, I can't remember them all, but you know, uh, enacted enacted in, in relation to the environment, you know, um, and also a, a kind of, a kind of situated cognition. But, you know, that, um, you know, that kind of um, emphasis on the supremacy of, uh, you know, of individual, cog of individual cognition, because we never really got around to talking about collective, uh, oh, thank you, um, uh, we never really got, a, got around talking about collective intelligence or, collect, or collective in, in, in cognition. We, we don't know about collective intentionality. How do we understand collective intentionality? How do groups come together to do this? What, are, what is really collective intelligence? We don't, we don't ask, answer, you know, there's one chair, I think, in, globally on, on that Pierre Levy in, 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 in Canada uh, who's pursuing this kind of work. Um, you know, but when we talk uh, about um, um, you know, digital networks and so on. Uh, we, we do have still we're still living the consequences of the Cartesian, you know, Kantian 
kind of establishment of, uh, of, um, of philosophy, which really systematically downgraded kind of like questions of gender as well. You know, they're talking about uh, we, we know the, the feminists know this pretty well, I think, because they were they were the ones that focused on the body, on the body, uh, you know, in relation to cognition. So you know, there's a lot of work to be done here, and um, you know, for for educate for educators as well. And um, you know, we have to be, I think, very careful that um, what we do at our peril in relation to neurological damage to young to young children. Uh, through um, through uh, um, integrating them too easily and too quickly into these global integrated circuits. I was just thinking also about Kant's preclusion, the idea that you shouldn't put any end beyond the human. So we need to remember Kant in that context. <coughs> because if we are thinking about using humans for something else, yeah. then we've got a huge problem. Sure. Surely. Well, I'm, 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 I'm really only uh, agreeing with you. That was a very long um, process of agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>